So far, we've been talking about that hierarchy of biology and of the universe as a whole, where things are made up of smaller bits. We talked about how atoms make up macromolecules, how macromolecules make up organelles, and how organelles make up cells. What I want to talk about now is the function of cells in multicellular organisms like ourselves. So we have in our bodies over a hundred trillion cells and they all have to communicate with each other and they have to interact with each other. And they interact through the plasma membrane, which is the outermost part of the cell. So we'll start off by talking a little bit about the plasma membrane. We'll talk about some of the sugars and proteins that are attached to the membrane and stick the cells together and help them communicate with each other. And that'll lead the way later for talking about development. You started out as one single cell, the zygote, and you developed into a hundred trillion cells. And along the way, those cells had to take different functions. Some of the cells gave rise to muscle cells. Some of them gave rise to skin cells, etc. You have about 350 or so distinct tissues in your body. And a tissue is a collection of cells that all work together towards a common goal. So the cells that line your intestine, they all work together to keep things moving and to absorb nutrients into your bloodstream. And we'll talk about tissues as well today. Membranes are hugely important. They define what a cell is capable of. They define how a cell will interact with its environment. So we have a membrane that surrounds the cell, that's the plasma membrane or cell membrane. And then we also, of course, have internal membranes. And those internal membranes are going to make up compartments, organelles within the cell, and those compartments have specialized functions. So what you're seeing here is a diagram of the plasma membrane. We have a phospholipid bilayer, bi meaning two, so we have two layers of phospholipid. Remember that a phospholipid has a hydrophilic head and then it has hydrophobic tails. The tails are fatty acids. Also, we've got some cholesterol molecules that are embedded into that phospholipid bilayer. You can see one here. The large purple structures are proteins that are embedded within the membrane. And in some cells, there can be more protein than lipid. On the outside of the cell, which is towards the top of this diagram, we have carbohydrates. You can see them here attached to fatty acids. And we can see them here attached to a protein. So that would be a glycoprotein. We also have proteoglycans. This is what you're seeing here, this long feathery molecule. So that's also a mixture of carbohydrate and protein. And it makes up what's called the extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix is this protective layer around the outside of the cell. We don't have a cell wall. Instead, we have this extracellular matrix. And these proteoglycans make kind of like a jelly-like substance that helps protect the cell and also glues cells together. These large molecules that you see on the outside are collagen and collagen forms part of the extracellular matrix and forms a major component of a lot of connective tissues, as we'll see later on. On the inside of the cell, we have these cable-like structures, which are part of the cytoskeleton. And the cytoskeleton is exactly like it sounds. It's a skeleton inside the cell that anchors the membrane to other internal components of the cell. What you're seeing here is an electron micrograph, a photo taken with a transmission electron microscope of the plasma membrane. This is very high magnification. So you can't actually see the membrane with a light microscope. If you're looking at cells in the lab, you will see a dark line perhaps on the outside of the cell, but you're actually seeing the much thicker layer of proteins that make up the extracellular matrix. This is an incredibly thin structure. We've got two parts, two layers, and each layer is referred to as a leaflet. So we have a cytosolic leaflet or cytoplasmic leaflet on the bottom in that diagram that would be in contact with the interior of the cell. And then we have an external leaflet on top of that. 
This is a very stable configuration. And that's because in this configuration, all of the hydrophilic heads, remember they're very strongly hydrophilic, are in contact with water. Well, the hydrophobic tails are not. They're excluded from the water. So that's a stable configuration. Also, we do have van der Waals forces between the tails that help maintain this structure. Cell membrane or plasma membrane is selectively permeable. And what that means is some things can cross quite easily and some things can't. And the cell is able to determine what gets in and what gets out. So in this diagram here, again, you're seeing the phospholipid bilayer. You're seeing some proteins that are crossing through the uh, phospholipid bilayer or embedded partially into it. And you can see a rather interesting protein here that's got a channel in the middle. And it's channels like this that allow certain molecules to pass through and allow the membrane to be selective. Membranes do a lot of important stuff. So they are responsible for the selective uptake of ions and molecules, and also the selective release of substances. They play a role in cell compartmentalization. So they make up compartments like the Golgi body, the endoplasmic reticulum, etc. And because these compartments are isolated from the rest of the cell, we can have specialized functions occurring just in that little compartment. We can have a different pH in that compartment. We can have different enzymes present in that compartment. They're involved in protein sorting. So we'll talk about this later, but proteins that are transported into the rough endoplasmic reticulum can end up embedded in a membrane like the plasma membrane, or they can be excreted. If a protein doesn't make its way into the endoplasmic reticulum, it's going to remain in the cytosol, in the liquid portion of the cell between the organelles. Energy production. So the mitochondria is essentially a battery. There's two membranes, and what the mitochondria does is it builds up a strong concentration gradient of hydrogen protons across the inner membrane. And then the protons run through something called ATP synthase, and the gradient of charge is used to manufacture ATP. And we'll talk about that later too. Cell signaling. So cells have proteins attached to them that can be receptors for hormones, uh, for neurotransmitters. They also have carbohydrates exposed on their surface that can identify them as we've talked about. Cell division. So animal cells like our cells will grow in size as they're getting ready to divide. And when they do divide, of course, the cell is just going to pinch off into two. And that's accomplished by moving the membrane. Uh, there are motor proteins associated with the underside of the membrane. Those motor proteins can change shape and they can change the shape of the cell. Adhesion to other cells and to the extracellular matrix. So the membrane forms an outer layer of goo protein and some carbohydrate known as the extracellular matrix. And it also contains a lot of proteins that are used to anchor cells together. All membranes are made up of phospholipid and some protein, but there can be a huge variation in the amounts. Carbohydrates are quite often present, but not always. And when they are present, they're generally present only on the outside of the cell. The proportions of protein and lipid in a membrane can tell us quite a lot about what the membrane does. So let's just take a moment and compare a few different membranes. And we'll start with the plasma membrane of a red blood cell. Red blood cells are essentially bags of hemoglobin, and the hemoglobin is used to transport oxygen. But they're rather unspecialized. There's not a whole lot in the way of metabolic activity going on in the cell, at least not compared to a lot of other cells. And they have a rather unspecialized structure to their membrane. They have a pretty much even mix of protein and lipid. Now, if we compare that to the inner membrane of the mitochondria, the situation is quite different. So mitochondria have two membranes. They have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And the inner membrane is three quarters protein. Remember that proteins do all the work in a cell. 
These proteins consist of channels and pumps and other things we'll talk about eventually when we talk about um, cellular respiration. But there's a lot of activity inside the mitochondria and the membrane serves as kind of a scaffold to hold all of these important channels and enzymes in place. In fact, in many organelles, we can have enzymes lined up like an assembly line and they're all held in a specific order so that a biochemical uh, pathway can occur along that membrane. Now, if we compare this to a nerve cell and specifically looking at the axon of the nerve cell, that's the long uh, tube that comes off of a nerve cell that conducts an action potential, it's mostly lipid. So it's about three quarters lipid. And in fact, in myelinated nerve cells, we have many, many layers of plasma membrane wrapped around the outside of that nerve cell. The lipid acts as sort of an insulator. So there's not a lot of protein in these regions because the cell is not going to be moving um, ions across the membrane in these myelinated areas. So instead we have lots of lipid that will insulate the cell and prevent the movement, the easy movement of materials across the membrane. So at this point, you understand the basic structure of the membrane. What I wanna do is just kinda of go back and talk a little bit about the history of how we worked out this structure. And this is not a history course, so I'm not gonna expect you to remember names and dates, but I just think it's kind of interesting for you to gain an appreciation of how this knowledge was uh, collected. Okay, so again, we have a typical phospholipid here. It's got a hydrophilic head, which contains a choline and a phosphate, and then an uncharged glycerol. And then we have hydrophobic fatty acids attached to that. Note that the fatty acids can contain double bonds. And remember, when we have a double bond, that fatty acid is said to be unsaturated, and it causes the chain of carbons to kink slightly. We've also discussed how when you take phospholipids and throw them in water, they're going to try to form a stable configuration. The easiest thing for them to do is to simply form spheres. So they'll form spheres with the hydrophilic heads around the outside and the hydrophobic tails on the inside. But if you take phospholipids and you put them in a thin layer on top of a water bath and you shake it, you can actually get them to form a phospholipid bilayer. And this is something that's been known for uh, well over a hundred years. So again, we know today, membranes are made up of phospholipid bilayers. The interior is hydrophobic and the hydrophilic heads interact very strongly with water. As early as the 1880s and 1890s, it was realized that lipids were a major component of the plasma membrane. Later, researchers discovered that proteins were also quite important, but it took a while for people to work out how those different bits and pieces were put together. So in 1895, a guy by the name of Overton did some experiments where he collected plasma membrane. It's not that difficult actually to collect up red blood cells, split them open, rupture them, and then collect the membrane as a layer on the surface of a, a water bath. And that's what he did, and that's what subsequent researchers did to collect these membranes. Now, again, this is not a history course, so I don't expect you to know these names or dates. In 1917, another researcher proposed that the membrane was a single layer of phospholipids. So we're halfway there. Uh, not that long after that, it was hypothesized that the membrane was made up of two layers. It was a lipid bilayer. And this made sense. This was a stable configuration that wouldn't take a whole lot of energy on the part of the cell to maintain. Now, after this, people started thinking about how proteins fit into this model because they were realizing that proteins were also associated with the membrane. Some of the earlier models suggested that the proteins were stuck to the hydrophilic heads. Now, 
this didn't quite work because that's not all that stable. If the proteins were just held there by ionic bonds, for instance, they could be displaced quite easily. When the electron microscope came into widespread use, people were able to look at the plasma membrane and see those two dark lines that I showed you in that photograph earlier. And this was something they saw in all membranes. And they started referring to this as the unit membrane. But again, people weren't quite sure what those dark lines were. In 1973, Singer and Nicholson came up with a model that pleased everyone and it made a lot of sense. So they were able to show that the proteins and phospholipids and so on that people had collected from these membranes fit together with the proteins embedded into the membrane. And there are some peripheral proteins as well that are attached to the outside. This image here shows two plasma membranes. And again, we can see those two dark lines that represent the hydrophilic heads. And we can also see the space in between the cells. And that intercellular space would be filled up with uh, proteins of the extracellular matrix. And they act as a glue to hold the cells together. This is our current model of biological membranes. And it's held up quite well over the last 50 years. Lots of experiments have supported that this is, in reality, how things are arranged in the membrane. It's known as the fluid mosaic model. It's a mosaic because it consists of more than one part. So it consists of proteins and lipids. That's the mosaic part of the title. And it's fluid, meaning that things are moving around. So those proteins can move from side to side and those phospholipids can move from side to side. In fact, Singer and Nicholson famously refer to the proteins as icebergs floating in a sea of lipids. And that really is what's going on. It's a very dynamic, very fluid structure. And unlike in a lot of the earlier models, this model suggests that the majority of proteins that are associated with the membrane cross the membrane, or they're embedded very deeply into one of the two leaflets. If you were to take the two leaflets and separate them, the protein would generally stick to one leaflet or the other, as you're seeing in this diagram here. And this has actually been accomplished. You can take cells and freeze them very rapidly into ice, and then whack those frozen cells with a very, very sharp blade. And if you're lucky, some of those cells will split between the two leaflets. So the membrane will be split into two leaflets. And then you can take those cells with the ruptured membrane and take a look at them under an electron microscope. So there were a number of experiments where people did this. And when they looked at the split leaflets under an electron microscope, they were able to see proteins embedded into the membrane. So on the top here, we've got the view of the inside of the extracellular layer. And again, this is with a scanning electron microscope. So it gives us 3D images of the texture of the surface we're looking at. And this is the inside of the cytoplasmic layer. Notice that it's a lot rougher. All of those bumps are proteins. And when you rupture a membrane between the two leaflets, proteins that cross the entire membrane tend to stick to the cytoplasmic layer. And the reason is, that the cytoskeleton is down here. So we have fibers that make up the cytoskeleton and these proteins are attached to those fibers. So the proteins tend to stay on the cytoplasmic leaflet. That first experiment, the freeze fracture experiment, demonstrated that the membrane is a mosaic. So we've got protein and lipid, but the proteins aren't just stuck loosely to the outside, they're an integral part of the membrane. They're embedded within the membrane. Other experiments showed that the membrane is also fluid, and we'll have a look at a couple of those. So it's possible to take two cells and fuse them together to create a hybrid cell. What you do is you take your two cells, bring them close together so they're touching, 
zap them with electricity that causes little holes to open up in the cells so that they can fuse into one big cell. In this experiment, what researchers did was they manufactured antibodies that would recognize a protein or proteins on a mouse cell, but not recognize the same or similar proteins on a human cell. And they also were able to create antibodies that would bind to proteins in a human cell, but not bind to proteins on the mouse cell. It's possible to bind dye molecules to antibodies. So what you can do is you can dye your mouse cells one color, dye your human cells a different color, and the dye molecule is bound to an antibody that's bound to integral proteins in the membrane. So you take your antibodies, you throw them in with the cell, uh, you let the antibodies bind, and then you wash off the excess, and then you bring the two cells together to create your hybrid. Immediately after doing this, you'll see one big cell that is half one color and half another color. But if you leave it for an hour, it becomes one color. What's happening is those proteins are moving around randomly within the membrane. They're dispersing themselves, and we don't see those two colors anymore. We see the combination of the two colors throughout the cell. This next experiment is a variant of that. So imagine we take a cell and we're going to make a fluorescent dye and that dye is going to be bound to an antibody and that antibody is again going to bind to proteins that are embedded in the membrane. So we have our cell and the proteins have been dyed and now we're going to take that cell and put it under a laser. So a laser is a very fine, very straight, very intense beam of light, and we can use that to destroy the dye molecules within a small area. So we're gonna bleach that area. It's gonna be clear after we hit the membrane with the laser. The laser is only going to destroy those dye molecules, though it's not going to disrupt the membrane. If we leave our cell and watch it under the microscope, what you'll see is color will start to come into that bleached area. And it's because the dye molecules attached to proteins are moving into that region. So the membrane is fluid, it is dynamic, but I should point out that the movements we're talking about are almost entirely lateral movements. It's very uncommon for a phospholipid to jump from one leaflet to another. Instead, they're moving sideways or laterally within their leaflet. There are two broad categories of membrane proteins. We have integral proteins that are inserted into the membrane and quite often span the entire membrane. The defining feature of integral proteins is they have uh, at least part of their structure embedded into the hydrophobic core. So in some cases, most of the protein is on the outside, but there's an anchor that goes into the membrane. And then we have peripheral proteins which are attached to the surface and they're fairly loosely bound. They're held in place by ionic bonding and other rather weak bonds. And in some cases they may come and go. This is an example of an integral protein. It's also an example of a transmembrane protein because it crosses the membrane. So you can see there's parts that stick out on the exterior and parts that stick out on the interior of the cell. Very commonly, integral proteins will be anchored by an alpha helix. And you can see this one has several alpha helices that cross the membrane and embed themselves into the hydrophobic core. This diagram shows some of the several ways that proteins can attach to the membrane. So on the far left, we have a peripheral protein that's attached to the cytoplasmic side of the membrane. It's going to be loosely attached. Next to that, we have a single pass transmembrane protein. Single pass refers to the fact that it only passes through the membrane once. It's got one alpha helix that's going to anchor it into the membrane. Next to that we've got a peripheral protein that is more strongly attached to the membrane. It's covalently bound to a phospholipid. And finally on the far right we've got a multiple pass transmembrane protein. Multiple pass because it crosses the membrane several times Every time it crosses, there is an alpha helix that anchors it into the membrane. And the more passes there are, the more alpha helices, the more strongly embedded into the membrane it will be.
the proteins that are embedded in the membrane can do a number of important things. We have some proteins that are involved in transport. So in the example there in part A, you've got a simple channel and the opening in that channel is the right size, has the right uh, charge and the right characteristics to allow a certain molecule to move passively down its concentration gradient. Next to that, we've got a pump that requires ATP to move materials across the membrane, quite often against their concentration gradient, so from low to high. So in this case, the pump is a molecule that will grab onto something and change shape if it's supplied with ATP and dump that material on the other side of the membrane. Enzymes are embedded in membranes. And this is really important in the mitochondria. As I mentioned, the inner membrane of the mitochondria has lots of channels and also lots of enzymes embedded within it. So here we've got an example of a biochemical pathway. So we have a triangle, whatever that might be, converted into a square, converted into a circle. So this is an enzyme catalyzed series of reactions. And the enzymes that are working together in this process are located next to each other in the membrane. So they can all be stuck right next to each other forming an assembly line. Uh, signal transduction. So here we have a signaling molecule, could be a hormone for instance, like insulin, and it's going to bind to a receptor and the binding site is on the outside of the cell. After that signaling molecule binds, this protein is going to change shape and it's going to catalyze some sort of reaction on the inside of the cell. So it's relaying a signal from the outside to the inside of the membrane. Glycoproteins can play a role in cell-to-cell -cell recognition. In this example here, the cell on the bottom has a glycoprotein embedded in the membrane. The sugar part of the glycoprotein is exposed to the external environment and another cell with a protein that has a receptor site for that specific sequence of sugars will recognize that glycoprotein. And then these cells may uh, bond um, or any number of other things might happen. We have proteins that join cells together. So in that example there, we've got two integral proteins that have bonded to each other to hold the cells together. And finally here, we've got attachment to the cytoskeleton and also to the extracellular matrix. So the bottom of that diagram is the interior of the cell. We've got proteins that are bound to the cytoskeleton. And those same proteins on the other side, on the exterior, are interacting with proteoglycans and uh, also collagen fibers, which make up the extracellular matrix. And here's another example of glycoproteins and also glycolipids. So we can have carbohydrates attached to the outside of the cell, attached to uh, proteins or attached to lipids. Attaching sugars to something is a process known as glycosylation. So we would say that these lipids and proteins have become glycosylated. The other thing to notice that really feathery structure that you see um, mixed in with the collagen, that would be a proteoglycan. It's a mixture of protein and uh, sugar, but in this case, it's mostly sugar. These carbohydrates are very important when it comes to embryo formation. In the early embryo, we have some populations of cells that wander around quite a bit. They wander through the embryo and they know where they are in the body based on the carbohydrates that are exposed on the surface of the surrounding cells. If a cell finds itself in tissue that's developing into the liver, it will become a liver cell. We have to consider these carbohydrates when we're doing transplants, tissue or organ transplants. The carbohydrates that you have on your cells will differ from the carbohydrates that other people have, and your body may reject that tissue. It'll recognize it as being foreign. The immune system is aware of these carbohydrates, and if it sees cells, if it comes across cells that don't share your particular pattern of carbohydrates, it may elicit a response and attack that tissue. Blood types, ABO, etc are the result of carbohydrates that are found on the cell membrane of red blood cells. And if you look at that top diagram, note that whether you have O, A, or B blood type, you have this common sequence of carbohydrates attached to a particular uh, glycolipid. 
However, if you have type A blood, you also have this carbohydrate stuck onto that core sequence. If you have B, you have this one. If you have AB blood, you have both of those two types of glycolipids. And there are lots of other blood types. That's what you're seeing on the bottom diagram there. Uh, don't worry about the names of all of these, of course, but just to show you that there are many different glycoproteins and glycolipids that determine blood typing. Okay, I've mentioned that membranes are semi-permeable. Let's have a look at that. So biological membranes are of course semi-permeable, but we can also make artificial membranes that are semi-permeable. What we've got here is a simple lab setup where we've got two compartments filled with water or another fluid, and we've got an artificial lipid bilayer separating those two compartments. Now what would happen if we added a solute to one side? and I should probably define what a solute is. A solute is something that you dissolve in a solvent. The solvent is the fluid that does the dissolving. So if we added salt to water, salt would be the solute and the solvent would be the water. So if we add our solute here, we can do little tests to see whether or not it can cross the membrane and we can modify our artificial membrane to see if we can help it out. So let's say that we added phospholipids to our membrane that had a lot of unsaturated fatty acids. If that's the case, the unsaturated fatty acids would make the membrane more fluid, which would make it leakier. We could add proteins and perhaps those proteins would act as channels and allow the solute to move more easily. And what we find with these kinds of experiments is that even without any proteins, lipid bilayers are selectively permeable. They allow some things to pass through, but other things cannot. Very small molecules can move across the membrane freely, assuming they're not charged. So oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, they can sneak through the tiny spaces between the phospholipids. They have an even easier time if the phospholipids contain kinked unsaturated fatty acids. However, really small molecules and even individual atoms can't get across the membrane easily if they're charged. And that's because they're going to interact with the hydrophilic heads of the phospholipids. So a chloride ion, for instance, is negatively charged and it is going to stick to the positively charged choline. Um, sodium is positively charged, it's gonna to stick to the negatively charged phosphate of the hydrophilic head. Larger molecules, some can pass through, some can't, some need some help. It depends on the shape of the molecule, and again, it depends on the charge as well. Molecules that are hydrophobic, like other lipids, even if they're fairly large, can get across the membrane without too much trouble, and that's because they don't interact with the phospholipids. Now they may actually get stuck in the uh, hydrophobic core in the interior, but they're not going to interact with the hydrophilic heads. So hydrophobic molecules, even if they're fairly large, can get through easily. Uncharged small molecules can get through very easily. Um, small molecules that are not charged, but are polar, have a bit more difficulty. So water, for instance, water will move across the membrane, but your cells have a transporter, uh, an aquaporin it's called, that allows water to move much faster. Um, these little pores allow the water to move about 10 times faster. Large uncharged polar molecules, if they're uncharged, uh, that's gonna help them get across, but because they're large, they're gonna have difficulty moving the phospholipids aside to go across the membrane. And ions, even though we're talking about individual atoms here, remember an ion is a charged atom, even though we're talking about individual atoms, because they have a full charge, they don't get across the membrane very easily at all. So the cell has to have channels and pumps and so on to move these things effectively. All right, so how do molecules move across membranes? The simplest way is just simple diffusion. 
So diffusion is the movement of molecules down a concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And incidentally, when you see square brackets like that, it's a shorthand for concentration. Um, you'll, you'll have seen that before if you've taken any chemistry. So if the membrane is permeable to the molecule, the molecule can move down its concentration gradient. Diffusion is a passive process. What I mean by that is it doesn't require any energy. Diffusion is simply due to random motions and collisions. So the molecules in our little setup here were all concentrated on one side. We've got two different solutes here. But if we leave this to equilibrate, it will eventually. And that's just due to random collisions between molecules. We'll get to a point where we have the same concentration of both solutes on either side. Again, assuming they can move freely across the membrane. And at that point, we will have continued random movements of stuff, but it will happen at the same rate in both directions. So if we put dye molecules in a permeable sac, let's say, and we put that into water, provided the dye can move across the membrane, the dye molecules will bounce into each other, they'll spread themselves out until we have this random uh, dispersion and we have equilibrium being reached between our membranous sac and between the water that's surrounding it. Osmosis is a special type of diffusion. It refers specifically to the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane. And the water is moving because there's solutes that can't get across the membrane. So let's say that we have a solution that is 5% salt. That means that it's 95% water. Now let's say we put that solution on one side of a membrane, and on the other side of the membrane, we have a solution that's 10% salt. That means that solution would be 90% water. Let's say that the salt can't get across the membrane, but the water can. The water will flow down its concentration gradient. It will go from the 95% water solution down to the 90% water solution. Um, and that is osmosis. So here we have our setup. And we have a membrane that's permeable to water, but it's not permeable to the solute whatever that might be. So the solute is represented by these little green dots. And you can see we've got more solute on one side than the other. That solute is taking up space that could be occupied by water. So the concentration of the water is higher on the left than it is on the right. And the water is going to move down its concentration gradient. What's going to happen is the water is going to move across towards the right and it's going to actually raise the level of the water in that container. We'll get to a point where the force of osmosis moving to the right is equal to the force of gravity pushing down. And this is how an osmometer works, and we'll get to that in a moment. Now notice that most of the water is moving to the right, but it is a random process, so there will be some water moving back as well. But we will get to a point where we have an equilibrium, and again, the equilibrium is going to be established by the point where the force of osmosis is equal to the force of gravity pushing down on the right hand side. So in a case where gravity is involved like this, we'll never actually get equal concentrations on both sides. There are three important terms here that you need to know. And these terms are used when we're comparing the concentration of different solutions. Let's say I have a 5% solution of salt and I have a 10% solution of salt. The 5% solution is hypotonic to the 10% solution. Hypo means less than. The 10% solution is hypertonic to the 5% solution. Hyper means more. So think of being hyperactive, you're more active than you should be. Think of having hypothermia, you're cooler than you should be. Isotonic means the same. So a 5% solution of salt is isotonic to a 5% solution of salt.
Now we could be talking about different solutes that won't move across the membrane. So I could say a 5% solution of salt is isotonic to a 5% solution of sugar if we're using a membrane that is impermeable to both salt and sugar. As far as the water is concerned, the water will move down its concentration gradient. The water doesn't care whether we're dealing with salt or sugar or a mixture of the two. Now, when we're using these terms with respect to cells, we use them in a very specific way. So if we say that a cell is in a hypertonic solution, that means there's more solute outside the cell than inside the cell. If we say that a cell is in a hypotonic solution, that means there's less solute outside the cell than there is inside the cell. And you can predict, of course, which way the water is going to move. The water is always going to move down its concentration gradient. The important thing to note is that the water gradient is opposite to the solute gradient. So in this example here, let's say that the left-hand side of the membrane is the interior of the cell, and the right-hand side is the exterior. The green represents a solute of some sort, salt for instance. We can see that there's more solute outside the cell than there is inside the cell. So this would be a cell that's in a hypertonic situation. The solute can't move across the membrane. If that's the case, the water is going to move to try to equalize the water concentration. And the water is going to move across from the left to the right. So here we've got a little sac that we've made out of an artificial semi-permeable membrane, like dialysis tubing. So we use dialysis tubing in the lab all the time to concentrate solutions and so on. And we use it for simple little experiments like you see here. So imagine we've got our little semi-permeable sac, and this sac is permeable to water, but it's not permeable to sucrose. So the sucrose can't go across that membrane, but the water can. If we take a 2% sucrose solution and we put that into distilled water, so pure water, the water is going to move in. And again, the reason for that is because inside the bag, it's 98% water, but outside the bag, it's 100% water. So the water is going to move down its concentration gradient to basically dilute the sucrose that's inside the bag. Now, if we were to throw that into a 2% sucrose solution, we've got an isotonic condition. And in an isotonic condition, we do have water moving back and forth because again, the motion is just random, it's just diffusion, but the rate in and out is the same. Now, if we took that 2% uh, sucrose solution and threw it into a hypotonic condition. We've got more sugar outside. We've got less water outside. So we've got 98% water in the bag, 90% water outside the bag. The water is going to leave the bag. So the net movement of water will be out of the bag and the bag will shrink. An osmometer is a rather common piece of lab equipment and it's used to measure concentration. It's actually used to compare the concentration of two solutions. So you've got one solution in the machine that you know the concentration of, you've got another one that you wanna test, and you test it by basically comparing the solute content of the two. So this is quite simplified, this little diagram here, but this is the basic principle. Essentially, you've got uh, a solution that has a lot of solute on one side, and then you've got a solution on the other side that has less solute. So in our example here, the hypotonic solution on the left contains more water because there's more space for water to exist. Um, the solution on the right, the hypertonic solution, contains less water because space that could be occupied by water is being occupied by other molecules instead. And the water is gonna flow across that membrane. So this membrane is impermeable to the solutes to try to equalize the concentration. That will cause the water to rise. And as I mentioned in the example before, it'll get to a point where the force of gravity pushing down is the same as the force of osmosis pushing across the membrane. 
and this will give us the concentration or the osmotic pressure of the solution. How do these different situations affect the volume of a cell? If we have a cell in an isotonic solution, that means we have the same solute concentration inside as outside. And although water is going to be diffusing back and forth, we're not going to see a change in the volume of the cell. Your cells are happiest in this state. So the interstitial fluid, the fluid that is found between your cells, ideally should have about the same concentration of solutes as what's inside your cell. Now that's not always the case because of course your cells are trying to concentrate things and they're trying to get rid of things, but it's close to an isotonic situation. The interstitial fluid comes from your cardiovascular system. So it's basically plasma that seeps out from capillaries. A lot of that fluid is reabsorbed and goes back to the heart, but some of it doesn't. Some of it stays in between the cells. The concentration of solutes in your blood has to be closely monitored and controlled by your body to maintain this close to isotonic situation. Now let's say that we took a cell and we put it in a hypertonic solution. That means there's more solute or less water outside the cell compared to inside. Water will leave and the cell will shrink. If we do the opposite thing and we put a cell into a hypotonic solution, that means there's more water outside because there's less solute outside, water will move in and the cell may rupture. Now that's of course if the cell doesn't do anything. Keep in mind that cells do have pumps. They can deal with this by pumping out excess water. But for a cell, an animal cell particularly, to be in a hypotonic solution for an extended period of time, usually not a good thing. Plants on the other hand, prefer to be in a hypotonic solution. So the top diagram here shows what would happen to an animal cell, like a red blood cell. If we put it in a hypotonic solution, then the cell may lyse, which is a fancy way of saying rupture. So water rushes in, the cell expands, the membrane expands. Uh, the metabolic rate of red blood cells is not that great. They don't do a whole lot to maintain themselves. So there's a good chance that the, uh, the cell will pop. If it's in an isotonic solution, then the cell is going to stay the same. And if it's in a hypertonic solution, the cell is going to shrivel, which is going to be detrimental to the cell as well. Uh, we need water inside the cell, of course, for all the chemical reactions of life to occur. Plants and also bacteria are quite different because they have a cell wall. So let's start with the isotonic situation. What's happening is the cell is going to be flaccid. Uh, water's going to move in and out, but you can see it's quite different from the turgid condition. The turgid condition is when the plant cell is in hypotonic uh, solution. So in this case, the water rushes in, but the cell wall pushes back and we get this equilibrium forming where the force of water rushing in is the same as the force of the cell wall pushing back. So this is like a kind of a inflated balloon, I guess you could say. And plants maintain structure by having these turgid, uh, rigid cells. If a plant isn't kept in a hypotonic solution, so if the water in the soil um, is isotonic to the cells of the plant, the plant actually wilts, it becomes flaccid. So plants prefer to be in a hypotonic environment. If a plant is placed into a hypertonic solution, what happens is the water leaves and the membrane pulls away from the cell wall and quite often it ruptures. Now we're not talking about plants, so I don't expect you to know too much about what goes on in plants, but next term we will be looking at microbiology. And this is also what occurs in bacterial cells. They have a cell wall. And usually that cell wall is under a lot of pressure. They're turgid the water is pushing against the cell wall. And if you can weaken the cell wall, which a lot of antibody, antibiotics do, that can cause the bacteria to rupture. So that's kind of an easy target for killing bacteria. Weaken the cell wall and they will pop in hypotonic conditions. And this is what a plant might look like if it's in isotonic conditions. So plants do prefer to have these 
inflated under pressure cells because they give them support. So far, we've been talking about the passive movement of materials across a membrane without any form of assistance. But that's not how things generally happen in cells. Cells use integral proteins to move materials into the cell that the cell needs to concentrate and also to get rid of waste and secrete materials. These proteins can be channels. This is a protein that has uh, an opening in the middle that allows certain substances to move down their concentration gradient. We can be talking about transporter proteins or carrier proteins. These are proteins that will grab onto large molecules. The protein changes shape and moves that material to the other side of the cell. And then we have pumps. Pumps are using ATP as a source of energy to pump materials across the membrane. And quite often they're pumping materials against their concentration gradients. Passive transport does not require any input of energy. Molecules are going to move down their concentration gradient. We can't move them against their concentration gradient unless we expend energy. But in passive transport, there's no expenditure of energy. Generally, we have a channel that sets up ideal conditions for a particular molecule to move across the membrane. Active transport requires energy. So with active transport, we can move things that would be very difficult to get across the membrane otherwise, like ions, for instance. And also we can move molecules up their concentration gradient. Here's an interesting example of a molecule that allows for passive transport, also known as facilitated diffusion. This is a large molecule that is produced by bacteria. And the bacteria species that produces this uses it to fight and kill competing bacteria. So it's a large molecule, as you can see, there's a hydrophilic interior that forms the channel, and then there's a hydrophobic exterior that can embed itself into the hydrophobic core of a plasma membrane. So what this cell does is it produces this channel, and then it inserts that channel into the cell membrane of a competing bacteria cell. And what happens is that channel allows water to leave the cell very quickly. So bacteria cells, as I mentioned before, they're usually under pressure. The water is under quite a bit of pressure inside and the water can leave through this channel and that's going to desiccate or dry out the bacteria cell and kill it. And we've made use of uh, this particular compound and other compounds like it. It's something that's found in some uh, ointments and antimicrobial creams. Aquaporins are found in many cell membranes and what aquaporins do is they allow water to move more quickly across the membrane. So without the aquaporins we would have some movement of water. Water would sneak its way between the phospholipids but remember that water is a polar molecule so that does impede its movement a bit. But with this channel, water can move much quicker. It can move about 10 times as quickly. Active transport requires an energy source of some type. Quite often that's ATP. Proteins that are actively pumping things across a membrane are known as ATP pumps. Um, so the pump is capable of pumping molecules against the concentration gradient, so concentrating them inside the cell, for instance. Also, it's capable of moving things that would be very difficult to move otherwise. So ions do not move across a membrane readily. And quite often in cells, there's a need to set up a concentration gradient, to build a concentration gradient and move ions against their concentration gradient. So to concentrate ions between the two membranes of um, the mitochondria, for instance, or to concentrate ions inside a nerve cell. And that does require quite a bit of energy. So once again, we've got passive transport where there's simple diffusion of a substance across a membrane with no energy investment. Facilitated transport is a special case of passive transport. So it's transport using a channel protein, or in some cases, 
a transporter protein. And then we have active transport, which is going to require energy and will allow us to move things against their concentration gradient, which is quite often what needs to be done. Most cells have additional structures outside of the plasma membrane that help protect them. So I mentioned that uh, plants have a cell wall, uh, fungi have a cell wall, animal cells do not, but we have an extracellular matrix. And the extracellular matrix is that kind of layer of protein goo on the outside of the plasma membrane. Lots of collagen, um, lots of proteoglycans and glycoproteins that help to protect the cell and also help the cell stick to other cells. So in bacteria, we have this special substance called peptidoglycan, which is a mixture of protein and carbohydrate, and that helps support the cell. In fungi, we have something called chitin, which is quite similar to the cellulose we see in plants, except that it contains some nitrogen. The cellulose in plants, as we've talked about, is something you can't digest. Now that doesn't mean it's without any sort of function. That forms the roughage in your food, the fiber in your food. And it's rather important. It stimulates your digestive tract uh, and makes sure that your digestive tract is properly lubricated and covered with mucus. The extracellular matrix is predominantly collagen and that forms these long rope-like structures, and then also proteoglycans that add to kind of the gel-like nature of the extracellular matrix. Collagen is also very, very abundant in connective tissue. Um, gelatin, the gelatin that you eat, is boiled up connective tissue. So what they do is they take hooves and bones and so on and boil them and that extracts the collagen. We've talked about atoms and we've talked about the monomers that atoms can be used to make. We've talked about the polymers that are built out of those monomers. And we've talked about structures like the plasma membrane that are built out of macromolecules. We've talked about organelles and we've talked about cells. We're going to continue up this biological hierarchy and look at tissues. Tissues are collections of cells that work together as a unit to perform a certain function. Remember that the plasma membrane is a mixture of phospholipids and proteins. Many of those proteins and even some of those lipids have carbohydrates attached to them. So those would be known as glycoproteins and glycolipids. And those carbohydrates, as you hopefully remember, identify the cell as being part of you and also it identifies the cell as being of a particular type and belonging to a particular tissue. Unlike plant cells, fungal cells, and bacteria cells, animal cells do not have a rigid cell wall. Instead, we have a more flexible layer of proteins around the outside of the cell. And what we typically see is that we have these long filaments of protein, things like collagen and elastic fibers that we'll talk about, and they work kind of like cables or ropes, or in some cases, bungee cords. And then these filaments are embedded within a firm but gel-like material. So that gel-like material would be referred to as a matrix, or sometimes it's called a ground substance. So the example you see in this picture here of these guys uh, putting down concrete, reinforced concrete, this is similar to the structure we see in animal cells. It's not quite that firm, of course, but think of the concrete as the matrix material and then we have these rods that run through it. And the rods are like the fiber that helps support the extracellular matrix. So when you're pouring concrete, the rods are actually resisting tension. And you might not think it, but concrete can bend a fair bit in a structure like a bridge. And we have these rods to take up those tensional forces. And then the concrete itself is going to resist compression. And this is similar to what happens in the extracellular matrix. We don't have as much rigidity, of course, to the extracellular matrix, but we have fibers that will resist tension and resist outwards pressure 
on the cell, for instance. So the cell will push up against the plasma membrane. And because those fibers can resist tension, they will push back. And then the gel-like substance does resist compression so that the cell can't be squished. Uh, again, those cells are a bit squishier than something like a bridge. The extracellular matrix is highly variable. It's more variable than we see in plant cells, for instance, and other cells that have a rigid cell wall. Different cells throughout your body form different tissues that do different functions and have different requirements. And the extracellular matrix will contain differing amounts of fiber and different types of fiber, depending on what that cell has to do and how flexible that tissue needs to be. But throughout the body, collagen is the most common protein fiber. It forms rope-like structures. It resists tension well, but it's also somewhat flexible. All extracellular matrices have to perform three main functions. They help cells stick together, so the proteins act like glue. They will support and protect the cell. And also, they're going to connect to the integral proteins inside the cell membrane, which in turn will connect to the cytoskeleton. So the ECM is anchored to the cytoskeleton. Collagen exists as three long polypeptides twisted around each other. This is the stuff that gelatin is made of. So jello, for instance, is made of collagen. Collagen is really easy to extract. You just uh, take some cartilage and skin and hooves and all that kind of stuff and boil it up and you extract the collagen, which of course will gel when it cools. The collagen fibers that you might see under a light microscope, if you're looking at connective tissue, for instance, are made up of tens of millions of individual collagen molecules. Those molecules are bundled together to form structures called fibrils. And then the fibrils, in this case, have been bundled together to form a fiber. In the photo at the top there, you can see a number of large collagen fibers that are overlapping in different directions to help support the cell. The fibers are a lot like a steel cable that you might find in a suspension bridge. If you take a closer look at a steel cable like that, they're made up of many, many individual wires. Here's a very high magnification image of the extracellular matrix taken with a transmission electron microscope. Notice that the collagen fibrils are running almost at right angles to each other. So they're forming sort of a grid-like mesh like the one that you saw in the image of concrete being poured. And the space in between those fibrils is going to be filled with this matrix substance, which is a gelatinous proteoglycan. The extracellular matrix is tied to the cytoskeleton. And together, they're going to provide support for the plasma membrane and for the cell from the outside and from the inside. So we have proteins known as integrins, which, as the name suggests, are integral proteins. They cross the plasma membrane. They connect to actin filaments, microfilaments of the cytoskeleton on the inside of the cell, and they attach indirectly to fibers within the extracellular matrix, such as collagen. So everything is going to be tied together. Proteoglycans, remember, are mixtures of protein and sugar, but as you can see, they're mostly sugar. So we've got that chain of amino acids down the center, but then we've got lots of proteins coming off of this. These substances tend to latch onto a lot of water and they create gel-like substances. Normally, most cells within a tissue are going to be anchored to neighboring cells or to a basement membrane or to connective tissues. It's not always the case though. Blood is the most notable exception. Of course, blood cells are just surrounded by plasma. During development, we also have some cells that wander throughout the embryo and neural crest cells are a nice example of that. We'll, we'll talk about them later when we talk about the development of the nervous system. Multicellular animals are collections of individual cells that work together. And this whole system falls apart if the cells come unglued, so to speak. So the cells need to stick to each other. What you're seeing in this colorized photograph here are some cells that line the inside of the intestine and they're involved in absorption. 
and then one big cell in the middle that looks kind of strange and it's staying kind of green that's a goblet cell that's producing mucus but all of these cells are attached to each other. So we can see the location of the plasma membrane there, and there's gonna be elements of the extracellular matrix that are gluing those two cells to each other. Cells have to communicate with each other. This is especially important during development. So we have many different organs with many specialized tissues, and cells take their identity from the cells around them. This has to happen in order for cells to organize themselves into organs and organ systems as we develop. There are three main junctions in animal cells that either stick them together, allow them to communicate, or allow them to pass materials. The first type of junction we'll talk about is a tight junction. Now what this does is it does hold the cells together, but more importantly, it prevents material from moving between cells. So there is a gap between the plasma membrane and it is filled by components of the extracellular matrix, but that is not waterproof. The extracellular matrix is not waterproof. This tight junction is watertight. And this is what that looks like. It almost looks like stitching. So we have two plasma membranes here. We have rows of proteins that are embedded in the membranes that are coming together and forming this watertight seal. Now let's imagine that we had some sort of fluid, some sort of substance up here that was trying to sneak through this tight junction. It can't, it can't get past these seals. We see this for instance in the epithelial layer that lines the inside of the intestine. And the reason it's there is to prevent materials from seeping between cells out of the intestine and directly into the blood. We don't want that to happen. We want the cells to have um, an opportunity to select what the body wants and reject what the body doesn't want. So this forces anything that's moving from the lumen of the intestine to the blood to pass through a cell. A cell has to choose that substance. Desmosomes are very strong attachment points between cells. So they connect one cytoskeleton of one cell to the cytoskeleton of the next cell, and they act a lot like rivets. Here we can have a closer look at one of these desmosomes. Again, they are quite rivet-like, they're very localized. And on the left, you're seeing a photograph taken with a transmission electron microscope. So very, very high magnification. We've got two cells. The plasma membrane of one is roughly along here. The plasma membrane of the other one is roughly along here. Now, these desmosomes contain proteins between the gap between cells that will attach themselves through integral proteins to this massive protein that's found on the interior of the cell. So we've got all this protein here, forming almost a button-like structure. And we've got that on both sides. And then these proteins on the inside are going to attach to the cytoskeleton. Specifically, they're going to attach to the intermediate filaments, that's all this dark stuff here, that helps support the interior of the cell. So that looks roughly like what you see on the right, if you use your imagination. Here you can see those junctions in epithelial cells from the small intestine. We've got desmosomes that are gonna bolt or rivet the cells together. And then we also have tight junctions. And once again, purpose of the tight junction is to prevent this from happening. We do not want material to seep between the cells because once it gets down to the basement layer, it'll just go right through the connective tissue. It tends to be fairly loose connective tissue and it will get to the capillaries and it will be absorbed into the capillaries. So we want to force any material to have to go through the cell. It has to be actively taken in and then it has to be released from the other side of the cell before it gets to the blood. So again, the function is to make sure those cells have a chance to process what gets through.
we have a desmosome again shown there on the right and one more junction that we haven't talked about we'll get to it in a moment is a gap junction the gap junction actually allows material to move freely between cells we have our rivet like attachments called desmosomes and then we have something called hemi desmosomes hemi means half these are half a desmosome instead of attaching to another cell it attaches the cell to the basement membrane we have tight junctions that form a seal between two cells we have gap junctions that allow for communication between cells which we'll talk about in a moment and then we have tissue specific junctions that hold cells together and resist separation but they're tissue specific and those are called adherence junctions here is an adherence junction so note that we've got this collection of proteins that forms a structure that crosses the cell membrane and attaches to the cytoskeleton. And at the other end, it has what's called an adhesive recognition site. This molecule will bind to other molecules that have the same site. And if a cell comes from the same tissue as another cell, there's a good chance it will have that same recognition site. Those cells can stick together. If the recognition sites are different, because let's say one of the cells is a heart muscle cell and one of the cells is a liver cell, they won't stick together. So we have to have the same recognition site. And this is the reason we can have isolated organs and that organs can develop at all. The stomach, as it develops, will not stick to the pancreas and commingle cells with the pancreas. They will remain separate entities because of adherence. Here's a fun little example from the world of sponges. So sponges are not quite animals, but they do have adherence junctions, and they use those adherence molecules to maintain their independence, basically, from other individuals and other species. So here we've got two different species of sponge. And what you can do is you can take a sponge and you can blend it up in a blender into a slurry of cells and then dump it into an aquarium and it will reform a sponge. It's pretty cool. If you take cells from two different species and you mix them together and then you dump them into the aquarium again, the cells will settle out. They will look for cells that have the same adherence recognition site they will only stick to them and they'll stick back into a colony, back into a mature sponge. So pretty cool. And this is similar to what happens during our own development. As I've mentioned, cells move around and they look for their place. Um, they look for cells surrounding them that have the same adherence molecules. All our major cell types and tissue types have their own associated adhesion proteins and that results in this selective adhesion cells can only hang out with certain other cells um, they're not going to attach to cells that are very different from themselves we have one last cell junction to talk about and that would be the gap junction gap junctions consist of regions with lots of very large channels that directly connect the cytosol of two cells so you can see here we have this rosette of proteins with a big opening in the middle, and that opening is continuous right across the two plasma membranes. The cytosol can move back and forth, and anything dissolved in the cytosol can move back and forth as well. That would include ions, for instance, and ions will move across very quickly. So if this is a cell that's conducting an electrical signal, an action potential, so if it's a muscle cell or a nerve cell, the signal will move instantaneously from one cell to another. And in fact, the cells that are connected in this way behave as one cell. Things like messenger RNAs can move directly across without any trouble as well. So a messenger RNA that's produced in one cell can move into another cell and be decoded and turned into a protein there as well. Instead of communicating directly through channels, many cells will secrete a signaling molecule. And that secretion occurs into the interstitial fluid between cells. In paracrine signaling, the target is very, very close to the cell that is secreting the signal. So para means beside, these cells are right next door. In synaptic signaling, we're dealing with neurotransmitters that are moving across a synapse. 
a very small space between a nerve cell and another nerve cell or a nerve cell and a muscle cell or gland, something that will be affected by the electrical signal. Finally, we've got long distance signaling. And this is what happens in the endocrine system. And the signaling molecules we're talking about now are referred to as hormones. So an endocrine cell will secrete signaling molecules into the interstitial space around it, and then they will soak into the blood. And once they're in the blood, they can travel anywhere in the body, and any cell that has a receptor for that signal will be affected. So hormones are long distance messengers. They don't travel nearly as quickly as action potentials, electrical signals through a nerve cell, but they get everywhere. So once a hormone is in the blood, it will come into contact with pretty much every cell in the body. And if that cell has a receptor that can bind the hormone, then some sort of response will occur. Different organs and different tissues can have different responses to the same hormone. And it doesn't take much hormone to cause changes throughout the entire body. So a small amount of hormone can have a dramatic effect. Signal receptors have an area that will bind to the hormone and they recognize the shape of the hormone. So kind of like the enzyme's active site, it'll only bind a certain substrate. Receptor molecules are quite similar. So if the hormone is the right shape and the signal receptor binds to it, generally the signal receptor will then change shape and that brings about a change in the cell. Some receptors are embedded within the membrane and the receptive part sticks towards the outside. Others are found in the cytosol. And in this case, the hormone or the signaling molecule has to cross the membrane to get to the cytosol to bind to the receptor. Here we see an example of a receptor that's embedded within the membrane. And you can see on the outside, we have the site where the signal molecule is going to bind. And that's gonna change the shape of the other side of the protein, the bit that sticks into the cytosol. Quite often, the cytosolic portion has an active site and it's catalytic, it acts as an enzyme. So perhaps this binding of the signal will activate the active site and we'll get some sort of reaction occurring that generally sets off a whole wave of interactions. So we have this small input, one binding of one signal molecule that brings about a big change within the cell. Let's use the insulin receptor as an example of this model. On the left of this diagram, you can see that we have an insulin receptor that is inactive. It's actually in two pieces. If it binds insulin, the two pieces will change shape and they'll come together and they'll form an active site on the cytosolic side of the membrane. In fact, this molecule is gonna become a kinase. That's an enzyme that will take phosphates off of one thing and stick them to another. Remember that when you stick a phosphate to something, quite often you energize that molecule. So this can energize many enzymes and activate them. So it's gonna activate enzymes that are needed to break down glucose, for instance, and enzymes that are needed to do something with that broken down glucose. Also what it does is it causes vesicles that are storing a glucose transport protein to move to the surface. And then that transport protein becomes embedded within the membrane so that glucose can be brought in. But the thing to remember is that a very small input can cause a very big change. And that's because in this case, we have the insulin receptor activating a small number of enzymes. And then those enzymes will all activate their own enzymes and then they'll activate enzymes. At the same time, some of the enzymes and some of the other molecules involved in these reactions might deactivate other things. So we can have a huge change in the metabolism of the cell in a very short period of time just because of this very, very small signaling input. And I'll just point out that here, we've got this GLUT4 vesicle. That's the transport um, protein that I was talking about, GLUT4. And this vesicle is told to move to the surface so that it can embed that transport protein into the membrane and glucose can get in.
Notice that with these interactions, wherever you see an arrowhead, that means that something is activating something else. But wherever you see a flat line like this, it means it's turning off something. So we can very rapidly turn on a whole set of enzymes, turn off another set of enzymes, and even do the same to genes as well. So down the bottom, you're seeing what's happening in the nucleus. And just that binding of the uh, insulin to the receptor can shut down certain genes. Receptors aren't only found on the surface of molecules. Some receptor proteins are found within the cytosol. These are receptors that respond to lipid soluble hormones. So those are hormones that are hydrophobic that can cross the membrane without assistance. Insulin is not hydrophobic, it's not lipid soluble. It has to bind to an embedded um, receptor within the membrane because insulin is water soluble. An example of a lipid soluble hormone would be testosterone. So testosterone will diffuse into a cell and if there's an appropriate receptor there, that receptor will move into the nucleus and then this receptor will activate or deactivate certain genes within the nucleus. So this is a receptor that directly modifies gene expression. By that I mean whether or not certain genes are used. Whereas the one we were looking at before, insulin, had its major effect on enzymes and other molecules that were within the cytosol. Now some of them did eventually get around to having an effect on the nucleus, but for lipid soluble hormones, usually the receptor goes straight to the nucleus and brings about a change by modifying what's going to be transcribed. Another example of a signaling system would be what happens with gated ion channels. So in the top figure here, you have a channel that is closed. It will stay closed until it binds to a signaling molecule. And signaling molecules are quite often referred to as ligands. A ligand is something that binds to something else and changes it. So we have this ligand gated ion channel receptor that's gonna open when the signaling molecule binds. So it changes the shape of the channel and then stuff can get in, ions can get in. This is very important when it comes to triggering nerves and triggering muscle responses. So it's something we will come back to and talk about in more detail. Okay, let's finally start talking about tissues, seeing as that is the topic of the day. There are four types of tissues that make up your body. So we have two that are highly specialized. One would be muscle tissue. Its function is to contract, to shorten, and that generates force for movement. Then we have nervous tissue, the most specialized of the tissues. And these are specialized cells that are conducting electrical signals or action potentials. We have epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue is unique in that we always have a surface that's not attached to anything. So these are tissues that are exposed to the outside world or exposed to an inner space within the body. And then we have connective tissue, which as the name suggests, connects the other three together. Let's take a look at each of these tissues. So again, epithelial tissue is going to be lining hollow organs and body cavities or exposed to the external environment. We have an upper surface, called the apical surface, because it's the apex of the cells, that does not attach to anything. At the bottom, we have attachment to something known as the basement membrane. And the basement membrane is acellular, so it doesn't contain cells. Instead, it's basically a really thick extracellular matrix. It's made up of collagen and other fibers and other glycoproteins. Here we're seeing the classic example of an epithelium. We're looking at the lining of the small intestine. And I've mentioned most of these points of interest before, but remember that these cells have microvilli to increase their surface area for absorption. They have tight junctions to prevent materials from sneaking down between the cells and into the blood. We don't want that to happen. We want stuff to go through the cells. They've also got desmosomes, which are riveting the cells together. At the bottom of the cells, the basal region, it's the base of the cells, uh, 
The cells are attached to the basement membrane. And the basement membrane is made up of two parts, the basal lamina, which was manufactured by the epithelium, and the reticular fibers underneath that, which was manufactured by the underlying connective tissue. And typically that connective tissue is going to have some blood vessels in it as well. Um, there may be cells wandering around within the connective tissue, we'll talk about that later, but the basement membrane itself does not contain any cells. Connective tissue binds the other three types of tissue together, and also it provides support. So bone is a connective tissue, cartilage is a connective tissue, the tissues that bones use to connect to bone and cartilage, those are also connective tissues. So it comes in several different forms. We have this very tough connective tissue where bones connect to bone and where muscle connects to bone. We have some very loose connective tissue that attaches two tissues to each other that need to move around a lot. So areolar tissue, very, very loose, very elastic tissue, and it connects the skin to the underlying muscles, for instance, because the muscles and the skin have to move around quite a bit. And then we've got muscle tissue and nervous tissue. Muscle tissue responsible for contracting and generating force, and nervous tissue is going to initiate and transmit action potentials, which are nerve impulses. And finally, here's our terminology list.